music that makes me want to dance, so. So you, you want to break out dancing when you hear that. And it's interesting, you know, just having heard uh, from Lawrence Wong, who, by the way, is a perfect example of what makes this country special. <laughs> Brilliant, focused, and influential. And you wonder why people from around the world seek the advice of leaders in Singapore. That's exactly why they do it. But more to the point, when Lawrence and I were in the holding room a moment ago, we didn't take the time to talk about global affairs. No, I asked Lawrence what he was gonna listen to when he got home tonight. And he said, oh, probably Eric Clapton and probably CCR. And <laughs> at the point being, we're both musicians. And we concluded that if you really want to bring peace and stability to the world, we need a little more dance and we need a little more music, right? I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> In about 27 minutes, we can dance off the stage. <laughs> All right, we don't have a lot of time, but we have a lot to talk about. So if you don't mind, I'm going to dive right in. Uh, the news came out last night that there is a new peace accord between Iran and Saudi Arabia that was brokered in part by China, or largely by China. I'm wondering how you think about what that means and the inference we should conclude about China's growing prominence uh, in the world and, and if what we should take away from, from that arrangement that has just been made. Well, it, it's an important event and the world should take note, uh, and the United States, uh, my country should take note. So Xi Jinping, the son of Xi Zhongcun, he's a Mandarin. He comes from a governing class. He's a political organizer without equal. He is now beginning his third term, right. third five-year term. And at the National People's Congress, we've been through the party Congress, now we just have the Lianghui. Uh, the People's Congress, and he's of course been given the mantle of the presidency, which means much less than head of the party. But this is uh, an example of, I think, the role that Xi Jinping and his new team want to play on the world stage. For many years, they have heard the world, probably led by the United States, say that China must become a responsible stakeholder. Well, to me, this is an example of China being a responsible stakeholder. Uh, it's also an example that I think we're going to see much more of. China playing a much more prominent role on the world stage, not just based on their economic throw weight, not just based on geographic size, population, trade links with the rest of the world. All of that is a given. But how do you leverage all of that into political influence? And this is what you're seeing. I think you saw a little bit of that a couple of weeks ago with the peace agreement that was floated by Wang Yi uh, around Ukraine a 12-point program, which was dismissed by some uh, for being a little unrealistic. But, uh, you know, when you talk about brokering a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, a couple of things are pretty clear. Uh, of course, that's resulted in a proxy war in Yemen. But here you have two pro protagonists who uh, differ greatly uh, on regional issues, on economics, on ideology. Um, they both played a very different role in the region. To have China begin to broker a process, I think is quite a big deal. Uh, and it speaks to China's desire to want to up their game in the Middle East, uh, starting, I think, with the relationship with Gulf countries. And I suspect that the competition by the great powers of the world is going to manifest itself in the Middle East, as it will increasingly in the Global South. So this is, this is something that should not be lost on observers in terms of what it foreshadows for international politics going forward. So speaking of international politics, let's continue with that theme. Uh, we celebrated, well, I shouldn't say we celebrated, there was an anniversary recently, and unfortunately it was the anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine war. What does that invasion long term, what's the, what does that mean for the rest of society, for those two countries in particular, and how should both the Asian region and the U.S. be thinking about the aftermath of that conflict? Well, for the world, I think it signals a reordering in, uh, in, in global affairs, a realignment that has been underway that is now supercharged 
that is largely unprecedented in the last 70 years. So the idea that uh, we've had a nation's sovereignty violated uh, in a most grotesque way, the loss of lives, uh, a nation that has been essentially trashed by an aggressor, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, is and will continue to reorder the world uh, in terms of where countries affiliate. So the outgrowth of this for Vladimir Putin, who I've studied, who I've met with, uh, and his team, who I've got to know during my service there, means, uh, in a sense, a nightmare scenario for them. So if their desire is to recreate empire and to recreate a buffer zone, in a sense, a sphere of influence, which is what all great powers and civilizations seek to do, well, just the reverse is happening. So I never thought I would live long enough to see Finland uh, and Sweden migrate toward NATO affiliation. Mm -hmm. So not on only are we seeing the breakdown in regional stability in Eastern and Central Europe, but we're seeing a tightening of the security pact, which has lasted now decades, namely NATO, which for Vladimir Putin has to be the worst possible outcome. But then as it translates to Southeast Asia and the rest of the world, uh, what we're finding, particularly in United Nations votes, uh, is that the Russians have more allies than many people think. Uh, and you're going to see the world that begins to take shape and form based upon how this war trends. I think it spells uh, a very unfortunate outcome for Vladimir Putin uh, and uh, mostly for the Russian people, uh, a civilization that's a thousand years old full of beauty and progress, music, arts, and literature. But when you have such a savage event take place, that then in turn causes its population to suffer. And the brain power of the young generation begin to flee. You're losing your seed corn, and every passing day, Russia loses its seed corn in terms of its ability to compete going forward. The young entrepreneurs, the talented class, the doers, the innovators, they're migrating to Poland, they're migrating to Israel, they're migrating to the United States. So this portends uh, a very, I think, sad state of affairs for Russia going forward, economically, but also in terms of what the post-Putin period will look like. So you started to touch on my next question, was, which was, do you see a path forward for Russia and or Ukraine to re-enter the global economy? I see no way in which Russia will re-enter the global economy uh, as, as defined by recent definitions of globalization. Yes, there will be a black market. Yes, there will be alternative trading routes, which they're already taking advantage of through gas and oil and black market activities. That will always be part of it. But in terms of the economy, which is a trillion and a half in size, roughly the size of the state of Texas in the United States, and how that is atrophied based upon sanctions. So I, I never in my professional career have seen the about face that took place after the invasion with American and international companies leaving, Ukraine, uh, leaving Russia. It happened essentially overnight. You had everyone with the exception of ExxonMobil which had you know, a $15 billion plant property and equipment investment uh, in Russia. But to see how quickly those decisions can impact the fortunes uh, of a country. So its economy will continue to atrophy with no desire on the part of the major trading nations of the world to re-engage. With Ukraine, of course, there will be re-engagement. There will be support. There will be a, a major reconstruction effort uh, at the right time that will bring in talent, that will bring in money and international support to get Ukraine back on its feet. Thank you. So. In the introduction, it was referenced that you serve as the vice chair of the Ford Motor Company and have been in that role for more than 10 years, so you are deeply entrenched in the work that uh, the company is doing. Data show that the adoption of electronic vehicles is exceeding forecasts. What will the effects of the global economy be on these EV trends, and how do you think the complex interrelationships around mining and supply chains, manufacturing, finance, et cetera, is going to influence all of that? I think, Erica, you're, you're going to see one of the most profound industrial shifts in recent history, not just in the United States, but indeed throughout the world, 
Lawrence mentioned that he lived in, in Michigan and it even cited a place called Singapore, Michigan. I hadn't realized that, spending time in Detroit and Dearborn most recently. But the shift will not just include cars as we see them, look at them and appreciate them, but this will go deep into manufacturing, labor training, supply chains, new technologies, and mobility generally. So let me give you an example of that. So we're going from the internal combustion engine, which of course was made famous by Henry Ford 120 years ago, where he, and all you have to do is visit the River Rouge plant uh, right outside of Detroit, controlled the entire supply chain, mine, processing, all the way through to manufacturing and distribution. The, the complete uninterrupted supply chain. And then came globalization and things dispersed and scattered. Guess what's happening? It's so fascinating. We're seeing a reversion back to those early days, which is to say supply chains now will be controlled more by the OEMs. Uh, the mode of production and manufacturing will change substantially. And you will see technology and products that not only allow us to move ourselves based upon electrification, now we're dealing mostly with LFP kind of technology, which by the way, the Chinese through BYD and CATL own about 90%. And then the raw materials that make the, those batteries possible are also very much locked up by China, which of course has become a major public policy concern in the United States. But I think it's inexorable. And all you have to do is drive an EV. It's not just about saving the planet. It's about the superior performance characteristics of EVs. So I have an F-150 Lightning. So out in the middle of flyover country in, in the United States and Utah, people used to laugh at the idea that you would drive an EV until I pull up in an F-150 all electric Lightning with a 131 kilowatt hour battery. Anyone I put in that seat, and this weighs 7,000 pounds, this is twice the weight of an F-150 regular sized truck. Not one person comes back after that drive and says, no, nah, I don't think I like this. The performance is so superior that it will happen. So we're now at probably 7% of the market uh, is EVs in the United States. It's double digits in Europe and it's higher double digits in China. So just last reporting period, 75% of all electric vehicles were purchased in one country, China. Neo, Xpeng, BYD, to see where electrification is going, and I say this as, as an American competitor, to see the technological breakthroughs coming out of China, not only on the design and the execution of the cars themselves, but on the tech stacks and on the propulsion systems is just absolutely remarkable. So we are probably in a five-year hole in the United States, and I would say Europe as well, in terms of the work ahead to catch up to where China is today on, electri on electrification. But then you're gonna see the next phase, which will be autonomous driving, which will be the LIDAR and radar features around the car that allow for you to get an hour back of your day. So what's the greatest thing that, you, that an OEM can give a customer? It's time back in your day. So if I can give you an hour back in your day, where otherwise you'd be driving, hands on, eyes on the road, feet on the pedals. I can give you back one hour to have a meeting, to converse with your friends, to watch streaming or whatever, or to sit in the back of a fully autonomous L3 or L4 van or car. That's giving you something very precious. And I think we're just a few short years away from this being a reality which will be in a sense on the, high, on the super highways in the United States, if you can imagine Amtrak, and I think it probably puts Amtrak out of business, a steady stream of fully autonomous cars moving along at 100, 110 miles an hour on uh, American highways uh, in an effortless flow without the collisions, without the loss of life, with the improved and enhanced quality of life that that carries with it. How does Ford think about not the technology associated with the EVs, but the human behavior associated with the history we have with driving and the feel that we have control over the car and the concern about not having that control? How do we get to that point where we as individuals, as humans, adopt and accept the new technology? It's a great question, and I think it will be acquired over time. 
you will have some who will never want to give up the internal combustion F-150, uh, which in my part of the country, in the Mountain West, of course, is going to last for a very long time. But I think you'll see people in the major city centers uh, already being experimented with in places like San Francisco and, uh, and Dallas, Texas, just to mention a couple, where this will become a reality and it will become just a part of our lives. As Lawrence said, you know, we have our challenges in the United States. We have our faults, but we also innovate our way to a new level of performance and, and excellence. And we carry with it new jobs, new training, new hope, a new tomorrow. And I think the whole area of mobility is going to be a breakthrough industry that's going to keep the United States well ahead in the technology development game. But in order to get there, we have to learn from what China has done in terms of how they have put the pieces together. Uh, and we have to begin creating supply chains that will look different, manufacturing processes, tra training centers that will bring a new generation of uh, workers into the workforce. So the policy signals are coming at us already through the Inflation Reduction Act, through the CHIPS Act, for example. You're gonna, be, you're gonna see onshoring of the critical raw materials and components that will be part of the next generation of transportation and mobility. And you'll see a lot more of that done with friends and allies and free trading partners like we have with Singapore. So here's a future-oriented question for you. When I was a kid, one of my favorite television shows was this cartoon called The Jetsons. <laughs> and The Jetsons really were, I don't know, 100 years into the future, and they had these things that were flying cars. And when I was a kid, we used to talk about the fact that when we were adults, we would be in flying cars. We're not yet in flying cars. <laughs> how, far away, how far are we away from, from that kind of transportation system? <laughs> You know, I used to give up the Jetsons for Gilligan's Island, so I was more, <laughs> I was more stranded was on an island <laughs> <laughs> than I was looking into the future. Uh, here is going to be the real challenge with autonomy, uh, to say nothing of flying cars, and that is the regulatory side. So one of the areas that has become terribly problematic in the United States, both at the federal and the state levels, is the regulatory jungle that one must get through to get things approved. So let's just talk about autonomous driving, for example. It's probably the case that NHTSA, which is the oversight body for this kind of thing, is behind in their thinking where industry and innovators are, whether Tesla, whether Ford, or whether others. So bringing them current in terms of the rules and regulations around just autonomous driving is gonna be very, very challenging. So the product might be ready, but the regulations might be lagging. And then you're gonna have the state and local officials who control other roads who are gonna to wanna to say in the same thing. So before we start talking about flying, <laughs> Jetson style, let's stick to the roads and see how quickly we can actually right. make mobility and autonomy happen. So not my lifetime, you're saying? <laughs> Probably not, okay. <laughs> All right, let's switch gears a little bit. And uh, as Asaf mentioned in your introduction, you have had a tremendous amount of leadership experiences, and I want to just pick your brain a little bit about what it means to be a leader today in today's environment, whether it's a political leader, whether it's a corporate leader, uh, and who are some of your mentors or leaders that you have admired over the years? I've been fortunate in the sense that I've been around some incredible people in my career. And I've learned from so many of them. Uh, even right here in, in this country, I can name you three or four people from whom I've learned an enormous amount that has stuck with me. But the common traits that I really do respect that I think are most effective in leadership, it starts with humility. Because if a leader isn't humble and vulnerable and willing to take criticism, and adapt and change as you move, you're not going to last. Number two, we've been given two ears and one mouth for a reason. We should be listening twice as much as we're talking, and we rarely do that. Have you noticed that in hard charging America, just to cite one example, you're kind of rewarded or you're defined by 
how quickly you speak and how many words you can get in edgewise. So I come from the world of politics, unfortunately, where I've spent half my career. Well, that's all it's about. Nobody listens. Nobody listens and thinks and approaches problem solving with a sense of humility, that maybe they were wrong, that maybe they need to change. So consequently, if you extrapolate this out in the political domain, you have forces that are irreconcilable because all they do is talk and they don't listen. So the greatest leaders I've been around are those who actually listen. They take the time to hear out different points of view and process it. Number three, without a vision and the ability to articulate the elements of that vision, you're not going anywhere. So I would, I would say humbly <laughs> that for those leaders that I have watched and admired, and they range from Barack Obama, for whom I work, to Ronald Reagan, for whom I work. The, the elements that I saw in just these two leaders, you say whatever you want about their politics or their policies, we'll all agree or disagree with whatever, but it's human beings. The ability to lead with your heart as much as you do with your head, I think is a, is a, is a telling example of effective leadership. Thank you. So as you just described, you have had the opportunity to work across administrations in the U.S. Uh, how would you describe, with that context that you bring to foreign affairs and foreign relations, how would you describe your personal vision, speaking of leadership, for foreign, interna foreign and international relations? Well, we have a lot of complex nation states that are made so by history, religion, politics, demographic makeup, geographic location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it all begins with effective dialogue. So let's just start with the premise that nation states are not always gonna be on the same page. But we have to come together around some issues that matter most, which is how do you perfect the journey of the human being? How, how do you bring respect and health and education to the human, I don't care where, where you're from, where you're raised, how, how do you lift the human condition? I don't know of any nation state, any set of leaders, except those who don't belong in place, who would not stop to say that is my ultimate goal, is to lift humanity in some way, shape, or form, to provide opportunity and education w where you can. Uh, so you can come up with a formula that you know, allows nation states to get along, but human nature tragically is also just the opposite. And that is we have differing points of view, we have rivalries, we have struggles, and we have wars. So given that that is an overarching reality of the relations of nations, um, I think it's incumbent, and I'll end with this thought, for us to begin putting diplomacy first. So it breaks my heart to see that the United States, in a sense, has been out of the business of diplomacy. So to have the United States and China, the two most powerful nation states on Earth, as defined by economics, military, the two largest emitters of greenhouse gas, uh, having no dialogue, having no interaction, having no ability to de-escalate a crisis, to me is absolutely unacceptable. So what keeps you up at night when you're managing a relationship either with Russia or with China? It's an incident that takes place that creates immediate escalation for which there is no ability to de-escalate. Nation states become hunkered down, pride takes over, history, their reputation on the world stage, and pretty soon you've escalated into uncontrolled conflict. So how do you avoid that from happening? And how will the United States and China deal with that as we go forward? There's only one answer, because we have issues that in some cases are irreconcilable. That's okay, 
because everyone in this room, just like human beings, will have irreconcilable differences with one another. That's okay. You put those aside, you find those issues on which you can find common ground. And for the United States and China, there are issues where there's common ground. Plenty of issues where you can find common ground. And you begin to build a relationship around that while diplomats are doing their work of interacting, problem solving, talking, even though sometimes talking doesn't yield immediate results, at least you're there at the table facing one another and building that elusive word, which right now is running on empty, and that word is trust. When trust runs out between nation states, as with people, by the way, as with institutions of power, all hope is lost. And we can't let, we can't let the state of the world fall to that extent. We cannot. We have just a minute left, and I want to end on Singapore. So in 1993, 30 years ago, you concluded your first U.S. ambassadorship here in Singapore. What are some of your favorite memories from that time, and what were some of the most important issues, either regionally or globally, that you dealt with at that <laughs> time? Well, Highlights. Uh, <laughs> having former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew call a young diplomat into his office and begin to provide a lecture, a tutorial on the world. <laughs> Try that on for size. Uh, <laughs> I would sit back trying to take notes and trying to take it all in. I, I look back on those experiences as the most valued of my entire career. I listened and I learned. Not everything I agreed with, but I got great wisdom that I carried through life. The issues that mattered Economics, people want to grow, they want to prosper. The early seeds, the early seeds of the U.S.-Singapore Free Trade Agreement were started in those years. And I had the great fortune of coming back as U.S. Trade Representative uh, when George Yeo was the Trade Minister uh, and putting together the pieces of what became the gold standard for free trade agreements, the U.S.-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, along with some security issues that we dealt with uh, as well. All I can say is Singapore has been a great friend and a great partner. People call certain nation states indispensable. I would call Singapore one such indispensable nation, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. And you have been an indispensable leader. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, Governor. It has been a delightful Thank conversation. You, Thank you, Erica. Pleasure is all mine.